January 1945, the Allies are winning the war against the Third Reich. But in the bitter cold of a Belgian winter, American soldiers are about to make a gruesome discovery. Close to the town of Malmedy, they find evidence of a terrible crime. Eighty-two American servicemen are dead. Their bodies, many riddled with bullets, have been frozen in time. These men were once proud members of the U.S. Army's 285th Field Artillery Observation Battalion. Now, they lay dead, some brutally shot at close range. They are victims of an apparent cold-blooded execution that would become known as the Malmedy Massacre. But who was responsible? Attention quickly focuses on elite SS tank commander, Joachim Piper. Known to have been in the area at the time of the killings, his 5,000-strong tank regiment had been one of the most feared fighting forces in all Europe. State your full name. Joachim Piper. Eighteen months after the massacre, Piper and 73 of his men were put on trial for murder. This is the man that fired the first two pistol shots into the American prisoner war. But had the Nazi hunters who snared Piper abused both him and the principles of American justice? It is a hood similar to those which were used for bringing suspects to the interrogation rooms. For months before the trial, the accused claimed to have endured sinister mock trials and repeated violence. Was this justice? Many thought not. Including an ambitious young American senator, Joseph McCarthy. I think we all agree that everyone who can shed any light upon this situation definitely will be called before the committee, right John? In the end, the dust from Malmedy would take over 30 years to settle. Before Joachim Piper by then entering old age, was finally called to account. In the summer of 1944, the Third Reich was beginning to fall apart. In Belgium, Allied troops captured the strategic port of Antwerp. Their aim was to establish a supply route for the final push east to Berlin. But Hitler was in no mood to surrender. As winter approached, he now decided to gamble everything on an ambitious plan. His aim was to starve the Allies of supplies by seizing back control of Antwerp. But to achieve his goal, Hitler seemed to be asking the impossible. To push deep into Allied territory. Splitting British and American forces in two. And throwing Allied armies into disarray. If the plan worked, the direction of the war could swing back in the Fuhrer's favor. November 1944, Hitler began amassing the awesome force of his tank divisions, among them the 6th Panzer Army. It was commanded by an old friend, General Sepp Dietrich. Dietrich's plan was to drive west through Allied lines on three separate fronts. 
to spearhead the southern attack, he chose one of his most trusted commanders, Joachim Piper. Born in 1915 into a middle-class home, Piper was always a good Nazi. Der Vorbeimarsch wird von Reichsführer SS Himmler, Gauleiter Greiser und Korvettenkapitän Lüth abgenommen. He'd been an early member of the Hitler Youth, seen here on parade before Heinrich Himmler the head of the much-feared SS. Himmler's SS were originally created as Hitler's personal bodyguard, but Himmler had transformed them into a well-oiled and terrifying combat force. He famously demanded that all SS show honor, decency, and loyalty to each other, but not to anyone else. Marked out for success by the Führer himself, the 23-year-old Piper not only joined the SS, but for 18 months became Himmler's trusted adjutant. He once even accompanied his boss to witness the gassing of a live human subject, an early experiment to prepare for the extermination of the Jews. But Piper soon went back to what he enjoyed most, combat. Becoming the youngest regimental colonel in the Waffen-SS, in 1943 he fought at the Battle of Kursk. It was the greatest tank battle of all time. Nearly 500 of his men were killed in one day. By then a highly decorated soldier, he was now about to take on a posting which would lead him into the dark world of war crimes. In the winter of 1944, Marlene Dietrich was entertaining Allied troops in Europe. Most were confident that all-out victory was close. Hitler, though, was about to catch everyone unawares. On December the 16th, 1944, his massive campaign began. It became known as the Battle of the Bulge. At the forefront was the might of Piper's 1st SS tank regiment. The battle would last 40 days. And 20,000 would die on each side. The contest, fought in Belgian territory known as the Ardennes, started badly for the Americans. Gallant American unit, surrounded and cut off, fought in a sea of enemy armor. Anti-aircraft guns were fired point-blank as anti-tank guns until they were overrun. Thousands were captured as Nazi firepower swept everything aside. But this created a problem for the Germans. Looking after all these prisoners started to hold them up. On Sunday, December the 17th, a small convoy of the US 285th Field Artillery Observation Battalion were headed for the town of Saint-Vite in Belgium. What they didn't know 
was that they'd inadvertently strayed into the path of Dietrich's 6th Panzer Army. On the N23 road at Bonnier, a small village near Malmedy, the 285th were about to meet with a unit chillingly nicknamed the Blue Torch Battalion. Joachim Piper's 1st SS tank regiment. As his men stormed west to the River Meuse and Antwerp beyond, Piper's orders were to let nothing and no one hold him up. His men were young, many still teenagers, but they were also part of the Leibstandarte SS Adolf Hitler. Originally created to be Hitler's elite bodyguard, they were now seasoned frontline fighters. Piper himself would later write of their exploits. My unit was composed mainly of young, fanatical soldiers. They had seen thousands of mangled corpses, and their hatred of the enemy was such. I swear it, I could not always keep it under control. Around 1 p.m. at this crossroads, Battery B's small, lightly armed convoy was spotted by the advance unit of Piper's division. Known as the Spearhead, or Spitzer, its role was to clear a path for the main convoy, including Piper himself, following on behind. Immediately, the Spitzer opened up on Battery B. Hopelessly outgunned, the Americans had no chance against the Germans' massive firepower. Within minutes, 50 American soldiers were dead. Around 100 more immediately surrendered and were quickly herded into a nearby field. Most were men of the 285th Field Artillery Observation Battalion. Though Piper's men put them together with a small number of men from other units they'd caught along the way. It was around 1.30 p.m. The Germans now had a problem. To continue the advance, they couldn't take prisoners with them. As the rest of their convoy began bunching up behind, a small unit of SS men now eyed the POWs. One of the prisoners, William Merrikan, would later give an account of what happened. I saw Crouch stand up, point his pistol, and shoot an American soldier. And then another. And a third. to the ground without being hit. I could hear the bullets hitting bodies in the ground near me. A column of vehicles passed by. They shot at us too. The firing continued for several minutes. Then an eerie quiet descended. American was still alive. But it wasn't over yet. I could hear two Germans approaching in my direction. They came and stood right over me. There was a man's body lying on my leg. He moved, and one of them shot him. The bullet finished him off and went into my knee, but I didn't move. American continued to play dead, but by now the SS had finished.
Leaving the bodies where they'd fallen, Piper's unit could now move on. Their task was to move waste, and they were behind schedule. But critically, the element of surprise was now lost. In the following days, the Allies quickly closed ranks. Battles raged inside the small towns and villages of the Ardennes. Continuing even through Christmas 1944, Piper's unit blasted its way through more and more territory. And, it's said, committing further atrocities along the way. But Piper was by now desperately low on fuel. His solution was to keep pressing forward to target American supply lines. Meanwhile, the Allies had become highly organized. Piper would need to cross a series of bridges to reach his goal. But the Americans weren't going to let him have them. Bakers, Quartermaster and line of communications troops picked up their rifles and fought tenaciously against Nazi columns. in Belgium. The attack was blunted, the spearhead stopped, the Nazi columns contained and thrown back by men who had flung themselves into the breach. In the wild gamble of war, a momentary equilibrium had been gained. Finally, on January the 7th, 1945, Hitler ordered a humiliating retreat. The Battle of the Bulge was over. The Führer had lost, and so had Piper. As the Americans flushed out the last pockets of German resistance, it would be another 10 days before troops could reach the scene of the Malmedy massacre. they found at the Bonnier crossroads shocked the world. Buried beneath a thick pile of snow, the dead lay where they had fallen. Each one frozen into a grotesque position. All were painstakingly marked with a number and photographed before being taken away for autopsy. Any Nazis found still at the scene were immediately arrested. In all, 82 prisoners of war had been killed by Piper's men. was now all but over. Within months, Hitler's dream of supremacy would lie in tatters as Berlin itself, the heart of the Third Reich, was sacked by the Russians. In May 1945, it was all over. Russian flag was raised high over the Reichstag. General Eisenhower, commander of Allied occupying forces, now began the task of rebuilding Europe. But first, 
he had unfinished business with the war criminals of Nazi Germany, including Joachim Piper. Teams of investigators were sent to hunt down and interrogate suspects. But finding the guilty was not easy. In the post-war chaos, huge numbers of Germans were being detained in prison camps across Europe. Most would be allowed to return home But special instructions were given to seek out all suspected war criminals, as well as anyone who had served in the SS. Within weeks, over 1,000 former soldiers in Piper's unit, the 1st SS Panzer Regiment, had been pulled in for questioning. All were now potential war criminals. But the real prize was Piper himself. Abandoning his unit with no fuel, Piper had made a desperate attempt to escape by walking home. But just six miles short of his goal, in Bavaria, he was captured by American troops. Even then, he might still have got away. Not realizing who he was, Piper was detained in an Allied prison camp near Nuremberg. But it was only a matter of time before a keen-eyed member of the War Crimes Commission spotted his name on a roster. Piper was immediately arrested. Seventy-four Germans were implicated in the Malmedy massacre. Now all of them, including Piper, were moved to a military prison at Schwabisch Hall near Stuttgart. Joining them was the leader of the 6th SS Panzer Army, Piper's own commanding officer, General Sepp Dietrich. A 12-man investigating team, headed by Lieutenant Colonel Burton Ellis, was sent from 3rd Army Headquarters. His chief interrogator was Lieutenant William Pearl, a passionate Zionist who was determined to gather as much evidence as he could before the start of a huge show trial. Pearl was convinced that Piper's unit had carried out cold-blooded murder. He further believed that before the Battle of the Bulge had even begun, Adolf Hitler had personally ordered that any prisoners of war captured en route to Antwerp were to be executed. This was a flagrant breach of the rules of war. And though the orders were never written down, Pearl was convinced that both Dietrich and Piper had known about them, and that at Malmedy, on Piper's specific instructions, they had been carried out to the letter. But to make the theory stand up in court, Pearl needed confessions. In the corridors and cells of Schwabisch Hall, the interrogation team now went to work on their 74 suspects. Controversy still rages about Pearl's methods. Many of the accused would later complain about the tactics used to make them talk. There were extended periods of solitary confinement, bread and water diets, even violence in the interrogation room. One even claimed William Pearl himself had attacked prisoners. Others spoke of burning matches under fingernails and a dentist regularly called to fix broken teeth. But Pearl's most bizarre idea was also his most controversial. The routine was always the same. Prisoners told of being forced to wear black hoods in what they called the death cell. 
Before them, a fake prosecution and defense counsel. Pearl often played prosecutor. The table was covered in a black cloth and dressed with intimidating props. This was nothing less than a mock trial. Pearl always denied using coercion and violence. Though the intense psychological pressure inevitably took its toll. In March 1946, an 18-year-old SS private was found dead in his cell. Shortly before, he'd been interrogated by William Pearl. Again, Pearl would reject allegations of wrongdoing. But no one could deny that he now had what he wanted. A fistful of signed confessions and a case ready to go to trial. In May 1946, 74 men of the Leibstandarte SS Adolf Hitler assembled inside a makeshift courtroom at the former Nazi concentration camp in Dachau. There was no jury, only a specially convened panel of military judges gathered together to rule on a heinous crime. The killing, shooting, ill treatment, abuse, and torture of members of the armed forces of the United States of America, then at war with the then German Reich. The prosecution will endeavor to present the evidence in a chronological order. Chief prosecution attorney was Burton Ellis. On the order of the regimental commander Piper, the 1st SS Panzer Regiment murdered in at least 94 known incidences. Though not actually present during the Malmody massacre, Piper was seen by many as responsible for the actions of his men. Actions which, it was alleged, led to many murders along 1st SS Panzer Regiment's terrifying journey through Belgium. The Blowtorch Battalion had, it was claimed, shown no mercy, not even to civilians. And the man who gave them their orders now found himself standing in the dock. State your full name. Joachim Piper. Joachim Piper, P-I-E-P-E-R. How old are you? I am 30 years old. 31 years old. Were you ever a member of the armed forces of the German Reich? I was a member of the Waffen SS from October 1934 until the end of the war. I signed accused number 42. Sit down. Piper, a once powerful man, was now reduced to a number. Just like the 82 American soldiers whose bodies were revealed beneath the snow of the Ardennes. Using the confessions secured by William Pearl, Ellis sought to prove that Piper, though not actually present at the Malmody massacre, had acted on Hitler's express orders to authorize the execution of prisoners of war. And to make the point, his star witness was Virgil P. Larry, one of the 54 men who survived the massacre. Dodging a hail of bullets, Larry had made a run for cover at the other end of the field. All men in our group had their hands over their head in this manner. Now he was asked to relive the moments leading up to the shooting, when an SS corporal had pointed his gun into the field. He then fired two shots into our group. The first shot, a man to my right front, approximately here, with his hands up in this manner, went down like this. But who was the soldier who'd fired his gun first? Larry was now asked to identify him. 
This is the man that fired the first two pistol shots into the American prisoner of war. That's the man that he asked the fact they told us just the American. It was damning evidence. But the accused fought back. Defense attorney, Lieutenant Colonel Willis M. Everett, claimed the killings were not premeditated, but an accident of war, born out of confusion in the heat of battle. In other words, this wasn't murder. Bear in mind as you consider the individual case of each accused, that primitive impulses of vengeance and retaliation among victimized people are often called forth in the heat of battle. The second part of Everett's defense was that signed confessions obtained before the trial were inadmissible since they'd been wrung out of the accused through foul means. Now, the man largely responsible for the pre-trial interrogations took the stand. William R. Pearl, first lieutenant with war crimes branch, USFET, at present on temporary duty with Third Army. When were you assigned to war crimes branch? In July 1945. What has your assignment been with war crimes branch during the past six months? I have been chief interrogator on the Malmedy case. Pearl argued the tough tactics had been necessary, including the use of hoods. Tell the court what it is. It is a hood similar to those which were used for bringing suspects to the interrogation rooms and bringing them back again to their cells. He denied making up statements. Whenever he wanted something to put in, of course it was put in. He also said any maltreatment was meted out not by his interrogation team, but by Polish prison guards. Dietrich once mentioned to me that being brought to an interrogation room, he was kicked by somebody he could not identify. Dietrich had me einmal gesagt, dass während der Zeit Vernehmungszimmer geführt wurde, er von jemandem, der nicht identifizieren konnte, getreten worden war. Into his behind. Of, uh, in seinen Händen. Pearl insisted that persuasion alone had delivered signed confessions, including Piper's own, in which he'd finally admitted that executing POWs in the Battle of the Bulge had been official policy. Now, Piper himself was dramatically called to the stand. Now I'll read this paragraph from the statement of yours, which is dated 25th April. To my question of what he would do with prisoners, he answered, we do not give pardon. If we get caught, we, all, we will also be bumped off. Is that true? In the world. Yes. Ich habe gestern ausgesagt, I stated, dass Sie kein Pardon geben würden, that they would not give any pardon, da Sie ebenfalls erschossen werden würden, wenn Sie in Feindes Hand fielen. Because they would be shot in the same manner if they would happen to fall into enemy's hand. Und dass Sie eingesetzt würden und in den gleichen Verhältnissen wie die britischen Kommandounternehmen. And that they were put into operation under the same conditions as the British, British commando undertakings. Piper appeared to have damned himself by admitting everything. His only complaint, that he himself had endured harsh treatment at the hands of the Americans. I was arrested for five weeks in a cellar which was nearly completely dark. Welche auch keine Lichtanlage besaß. <coughs> and there were no facilities through which the light could enter the room. <coughs> konnte mich innerhalb von vier Wochen lediglich einmal waschen. And in the course of four weeks, I could wash myself only once. In the end, the defense could find only one person to say anything good about Piper. 
Major Harold D. McCown's unit had been captured by Piper after heavy fighting in the Belgian village of La Glaise. But he testified that as POWs, the impressive Piper had treated both he and his men well. It was surprising evidence, but was it enough to save Piper? Prosecution attorney Burton Ellis thought not. It is a bloody record indeed that the first SS Panzer Regiment set for itself in this one short week. Let us hope that it has never been surpassed, nor that never again will such a record even be approached. These comrades all would have been alive today if it had not been for the first SS Panzer Regiment, and they must not have died in vain. From their deaths, let there come a clear understanding to our former enemies that they cannot wage war in a merciless and ruthless manner. It must be brought home to the German people that the principle of extermination which guided them in their last battle will not create for them a new and better world, but will only bring disaster to their homeland and to themselves. Let their punishment be adequate for their crimes. After Ellis had spoken, it was the defense's turn to sum up. The question is here put to you, do you consider force, mock trials, promises of freedom and so forth as legitimate tricks worthy of American army customs? They attempt to prove cold-blooded murder by admissions of one accused against another, cunningly dictated as a further form of stratagem. May it never be said that stark retribution has been freed to masquerade in a military government cloak of false legalism. I leave in God and your hand the fair judgment of these 74 accused. It was a passionate speech, but it cut little ice with the judges. First before them was Private George Fleps, the man said to have fired the first shot. The court and closed session, at least two thirds of the members present, at the time the vote was taken concurring, sentences you to death by hanging, death by hanging, death by hanging, death by hanging, at such time and place as our authority may direct. Over half the 74 accused were found guilty and sentenced to death. 22, including General Sepp Dietrich, received heavy jail sentences. The court in closed session, at least two thirds of the members present at the time the vote was taken concurring, sentences you to life imprisonment, commencing forthwith at such places may be designated by competent military authority. Finally, it was Piper's turn to step forward. Though not actually present at the massacre, he had now accepted responsibility for the actions of his men. The court in closed session, at least two thirds of the members present at the time the vote was taken concurring, sentences you to death by hanging. At such time and places, our authority may direct. Justice for the men of Battery B seemed to have been done. But the prosecution's joy was short lived. Serious questions were now being asked about how American justice was carried out, and it wasn't the first time. Hot in pursuit came the Rainbow Men. The route of their advance headed directly toward the most famous of all German horror prisons, the concentration camp of Dachau. The most notorious incident had occurred after the Americans had liberated the Dachau death camp near Munich. When they arrived there in April 1945, soldiers found unspeakable horrors. 
the camp had been home to 200,000 prisoners, around a third of them Jewish. Many had died amidst appalling conditions. These scenes so horrified American soldiers rounding up the SS guards that a few decided to take the law into their own hands. This picture shows the scene seconds after US soldiers had executed surrendering SS guards. More SS were raked with bullets as they gave themselves up at the bottom of a guard tower. As the liberation continued, a number of American soldiers were court-martialed. But the charges were later dropped. Many believed the SS guards had got no more than they deserved. The American people had, according to one senior officer, no stomach for a trial. But the Piper case, ironically held at Dachau one year later, had revived uncomfortable feelings. In the months that followed his conviction, several inquiries were set up to examine his treatment and that of his men. With the convictions increasingly seen as unsafe, 30 men learned they would no longer be executed. Though Piper himself remained on death row. But it wasn't over yet. The controversy now reached Washington. Nearly three years after the trial had ended, a full-scale Senate inquiry began. Asking the questions was a man who would be a constant thorn in William Pearl's side, at the time a little-known senator from Wisconsin, Joseph McCarthy. I think we all agree that everyone who can shed any light upon this situation definitely will be called before the committee, right, John? Under oath, Pearl continued to deny claims of brutality. McCarthy's response was to call for a lie detector test. But when the committee chairman refused, McCarthy stormed out, slamming the inquiry as a whitewash. And branding committee chairman William Baldwin criminally wrong. The subsequent report did accept that some mock trials had taken place, but Baldwin threw out claims of forced confessions and torture. William Pearl and his fellow interrogators were off the hook. But years of scandal combined with a changing political situation in Europe would still have its effect. Germany was now rebuilding, and Europe was a very different place. With the onset of the Cold War, Americans needed German friends wherever they could get them. For many, it was time to let bygones be bygones. By 1951, the last of the condemned men, including Piper, had their death sentences commuted to life. In 1955, Sepp Dietrich, commander of the 6th Panzer Army, was given parole. And a year later, after serving 11 and a half years, Joachim Piper himself walked free. For the survivors of Malmedy, it was a bitter pill to swallow. At the intersection where 82 men died stands a memorial to the men of Battery B, the 285th Field Artillery Observation Battalion. The field where the men died is just a short walk away. Inside a museum specially built to remember the massacre, is a helmet which belonged to one of Battery B's medics. 
In a lull after the initial shooting, he'd found himself unhurt. Now his medical training kicked in. As an SS soldier looked on, the medic patched the wounds of the man next to him. After patiently waiting for him to finish, the German shot them both. Twenty-one victims of the Malmedy massacre lie here at the military cemetery at Henri Chapelle, 25 miles north of Malmedy. Tag 13, Gilbert R. Pittman. Tag 3, Luke S. Schwartz. Tag 46, James E. Lurs. Tag 45, Paul R. Carr. All were victims of the brutal shootings which happened in December 1944. Yet Joachim Piper had not only escaped the hangman's noose, but walked free. Many years after the shootings, he wrote of the killings. It's so long ago. Even I don't know the truth. If I had ever known it, I have long forgotten it. All I know is that I took the blame as a good CEO should and was punished. So what did become of Joachim Piper? He had been one of the Third Reich's brightest stars, but his life was never the same after Malmedy. Demeaned by a humble job selling cars, in 1972, Piper abandoned Germany and went into peaceful semi-retirement in the French village of Troves. For four years, he remained below the radar, building his own home and translating books about the war. Then, without warning, a poster appeared in the village. It read, Citizens of Troves, a war criminal, SS Joachim Piper, is among you. Piper's cover had been blown. On Bastille Day, the 14th of July, 1976, he fought his last battle. No one knows the identity of the Nazi hunters who launched an assault on his house. But after throwing firebombs into the building, they disappeared, leaving the 66-year-old Joachim Piper 